Um, and now I'm delighted to welcome Professor Adam Mead, who's going to talk to us about clinical trials and research. Welcome. Well, thank you uh, very much for the invitation to come and talk today. So I've got the task of summarizing recent clinical and scientific research in MPN. And it is quite a task, I have to say, because, you know, this is a very, very active area uh, of, of research, both scientifically and clinically. So I'm going to split my talk into two halves. First of all, focus a little bit on some interesting scientific advances in our understanding of MPN. And then the second half, I'm, I'm going to whiz through some, I think, of the most exciting clinical research uh, that is going on. Uh, in MPNs. So I'm, I'm going to start off with kind of partly, partly a question, really. So the, the JAK2 V617F, this is a mutation that, that occurs very commonly in um, myeloproliferative neoplasms. So it's named after, this is the god Janus, a Roman god of beginning and end, so a god that faces in two directions. And, and it's caught, that, that's it's called the Janus activated kinase. It's named after this god because the shape of the protein that's got two different um, facing um, what's called kinase domains. So that's why it's called this. And we know this is a very common mutation in MPN. We know if you develop inhibitors against this drug, uh, against this mutation, patients can benefit from that. If you put the mutation in, in the laboratory into um, model systems, it causes a myeloproliferative neoplasm. So surely we know what causes MPN. This mutation is the cause of MPN. So this is a slightly philosophical slide. So this is when I was a medical student and I had a bit more time <laughs> to read. This, was, uh, this is Michel de Montaigne. He's a 16th century uh, philosopher. And he had a famous saying, what do I know? It's always good to be humble about thinking what you understand compared to really what you understand. So I, I'm going to think a little bit together with you about the JAK2 mutation. What do we really understand about uh, its relationship to the development of MPN? So this is a study. Actually, it's not so recent. It's three years old, but it's quite interesting. And you may not know this, but if you look for this JAK2 mutation that will be found in many patients with a myeloproliferative neoplasm, you find it, if you look really hard, you will find it in about three to 4% of the normal population. So one in 30 people walking around with entirely normal blood counts, no myeloproliferative neoplasm have got the JAK2 mutation. So it's more complicated than simply the JAK2 mutation causes MPN. And the same actually applies to the other common mutation in myeloproliferative neoplasms, the cal reticulum mutation. So if you think about this, I've tried to put it into a kind of cartoon that, you know, the, the JAK2 mutation occurs in, in the blood forming stem cells. And in some patients, it does lead to abnormal blood counts and it does lead to a myeloproliferative neoplasm. But the reality is in the vast majority of people that get this mutation, no, no blood disease develops. So why is that? Why is that? And that, it's such a crucial question, because if we can understand that, then you can imagine it might lead us to understand better ways to tackle the disease and even prevent the disease from forming in the first place. So I want to highlight a couple of recent studies that have come out over the last uh, year from groups in the UK, a very, very active, cutting edge research community in the UK um, that have shed some light onto this. And, and this is... Um, work from the Sanger Institute, led by Jyoti Nangalia, who's a hematology doctor uh, in Cambridge. And, and she studied the life history of myeloproliferative neoplasms. So it's quite complicated to explain this, and some of the slides may look a bit technical, but I'm gonna try and explain them as, as simply as I can. Just one of the things before I kick off with this, you know, many of you may experience, partic particularly if you're in a teaching hospital, that you get asked, to donate samples for research as part of your, your visit. So it's those samples that are collected in the research laboratories that allow this cutting edge research to happen. This work was published in, in the journal Nature, which is the absolute very, very best journal that there is. 
So what Jyoti and her colleagues did in this work is essentially took um, blood stem cells from patients with MPN, grew them uh, in the laboratory, and then did a very clever technique where you can do whole genome sequencing in individual cells. And that allows you, what you may not know, is all the cells in our body all of the time are gaining mutations. So if you measure these mutations, you can actually um, work out the length of um, the, the length of time that a cell has had a particular mutation. And that allows you to draw these rather complicated looking trees that I will uh, explain uh, what they mean. So the, so the really interesting thing, so this is a patient um, who had a blood sample taken in clinic, age 23, they had a myeloproliferative neoplasm. You can ignore everything apart from this bit up here, which tells you the patient age 23, when uh, with an MPN, actually had the JAK2 mutation that developed either in utero, 6.2 weeks after conception, so that, that's before birth or before the age of one. So totally remarkable. This mutation has been there for a long time. Even more remarkable, um, this patient, a 50-year-old, the mutation definitely occurred uh, in utero. So the JAK2 mutation is occurring many, many, many years before people present with myeloproliferative neoplasm. The other fascinating thing is there's a big difference from patient to patient. So th th this chart shows you the, the kind of the growth advantage when, when a cell, a blood stem cell gets a mutation, how quickly is it growing relative to the other cells? And that varies a lot from patient to patient. Here's two, three patients um, with uh, the, just a JAK2 mutation on its own. And this is the, what, a measure of the kind of how fast those cells are growing. And it varies a huge amount from patient to patient. And if you plot that out on a chart, that the, 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 the growth advantage of that cell basically um, predicts how long it will be from acquiring the mutation to developing the disease. And in some patients, it's 20 years. In some patients, it's 60 years. In some people that are walking around with a JAK2 mutation, they will never get a myeloproliferative neoplasm. And we've got to understand why that happens. Because if we can understand that, then we might be able to tackle and even prevent the development of these conditions. Yeah. Are we looking at it personally? Yeah. How do you measure whether they got the JAK2 mutation? And if they don't show any symptoms of yeah, in, in the, in the um, population study, um, th this was a population survey, so samples taken for, for other reasons across thousands of people as part of an, a, a, a research study. So it, people with normal blood counts, entirely normal blood counts. Okay, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> No, I, that's good. Thank you. Okay, um, so I'm going to whiz through this. This is some work from, from um, my laboratory that, that is in a similar vein. Uh, this is a patient who came to see me in the clinic. And to very briefly summarize all of this detailed information, there was a patient that presented with a very big spleen, a mutation in calreticulin, which is one of the key mutations that cause MPN, and a bone marrow test that was consistent with the diagnosis of myelofibrosis. Quite young to develop the disease, 38. Then another patient who is in, in my clinic, uh, presenting very similarly with a very large spleen, needing treatment with a JAK2 inhibitor, ruxolitinib, again diagnosed with myelofibrosis at a relatively young age. Perhaps nothing too remarkable about that until I tell you that both those patients are identical twins. And they both developed exactly the same disease with calreticulin. Um, mutation, myelofibrosis, age 38. So we had to try and work out why this was happening. And I'm going to go a bit quicker just to explain it. What you may not know is twins, when they're in, in, in utero, in the womb, they share a placenta, so they share a blood supply. And, and so the, 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 um, the blood cells are, are shared between them, so they're essentially transplanted between them. So what's probably happened here, thinking about what I've just told you about, that sometimes these mutations happen very, very early in life, even in utero, is one of the twins got the mutation, and then it was transferred to the, the other twin. 
So this is another way of studying the same process that these diseases are occurring over a very, very prolonged period of time. Science comes in all shapes and sizes. We were fascinated by this um, process. So my, my poor old research fellow, Nikos, I sent him on a mission. What you may not know is when, when, you're, when you're born, you have a heel prick test and a little blood spot is taken and that happens for all children. And what you may not know, and I didn't know, is that they're, they're stored in, a, in, in the case uh, in Oxford, they're stored in a, in a warehouse um, 20 miles outside of Oxford in these boxes gathering dust over many, many years. So poor old Nikos had to go, they were all in a jumble. Yeah, and so what we wanted to ask the question with some of our younger patients with MPN, obviously with their informed consent, is whether if you go back to their neonatal blood spot, when they presented with polycythemia vera age 30, could we find the JAK2 mutation even when they were born? And what these little dots here tell you, you don't need to know anything else on this slide, what these little dots tell you here is in one patient, we could go back, he presented with polycythemia age 30, yet we could find the JAK2 mutation when he was born. And it's mind blowing, right? So this, this, this kind of makes, I think the key question this raises is whether when, when a blood cell acquires a mutation like a JAK2 mutation, is it destined? Here's Darth Vader talking about, if you're into Star Wars, talking about destiny with Luke Skywalker, you know, is it predestined that that's what's going to happen in 30 years time, this is going to cause a blood disease. Or more interestingly, and I think more likely, are there are other events that might happen and that might influence the way those blood cells behave. And some of the interesting things that we're researching at the moment, but I think you've heard a little bit about today, you know, uh, inflammation in particular, we're very interested in whether inflammation might influence the way uh, these mutations behave over time. And perhaps there might be strategies to change the way they behave and, and intervene in this process. And, you know, the other, I think, important takeaway from this very long latency, the very long time it takes blood, these blood diseases to develop, is with treatment. Perhaps we shouldn't expect an extremely rapid reversal of the disease. If it takes 30 years for them to develop, maybe treatments might take a bit longer um, to, to also reverse the disease. Am I doing, what, what time am I meant to finish? Am I, okay. That's, that's the science. Now I'm going to talk a, a, a little bit about some of the clinical uh, research uh, that I, I wanted to highlight. There, there is such an enormous amount going on. I've just picked out a few little uh, vignettes. Some of the slides are a little bit technical because I've picked them out of, of, of the, the, the actual scientific presentations, but I'll try my best to explain uh, what they mean. So I've got one slide on a really interesting new technique that is being applied uh, to um, aid the diagnosis of myeloproliferative neoplasm. So this is led by Daniel Royston, who's a histopathologist in Oxford. As many of you will know who've had a bone marrow biopsy, um, when, when you have a bone marrow taken, it gets sent to the laboratory. A histopathologist will look at that under the microscope and it's very, um, human dependent, you know, it's a subjective assessment, an expert assessment by a histopathologist as to the appearance of the bone marrow. What Daniel's asking is, can we use artificial intelligence to scan in images of the bone marrow and actually measure some of the different features of myeloproliferative neoplasms? Maybe that will allow us to classify the disease better. Um, so, so one approach is looking at the the cells in the bone marrow that, that make platelets, they're called megakaryocytes, and they are characteristically very abnormal in myeloproliferative neoplasms. And this is, instead of measuring that as a, a histopathologist, this is an, a machine-led way of actually, in a much more automated way, looking at the megakaryocytes in the bone marrow. And, and interestingly, one of the things, you know, that is really important in myeloproliferative neoplasms is the development of fibrosis in the marrow. And again, that is actually surprisingly subjective. As you may know, we grade it zero, one, two, three. But, but that, that's qu quite a blunt measure. And what Daniel is developing now, and this work will be published soon, I hope, is, is a method to much more accurately measure fibrosis across the whole of the marrow. And one of the interesting things you can see here, these different color coding, is you can see how patchy the fibrosis is. So, so 
this is worse fibrosis, blue is better fibrosis, and this is a bone marrow atrophying here, obviously magnified enormously. And you can see these patches of quite bad fibrosis in some places and other areas where there's no fibrosis at all. And capturing that complexity of information, I think, is going to be really important. Okay. I'm going to just briefly pick out two or three um, uh, interesting uh, clinical uh, agents in development uh, in essential thrombocythemia, polycythemia vera, and myelofibrosis, and I'll go quite quickly through these. So um, this is just a snapshot of the American Society of Hematology abstracts. This is one taken from the plenary session. So this is selected out of five to 10,000 abstracts submitted to the meeting as the very, very best. And this is a really, really, I think, very exciting preclinical. So this has not made it into, clin into clinical trials yet, but it's a very exciting antibody treatment that selectively targets the mutant form of calreticulin. So potentially, coming is a way of giving an antibody treatment that will selectively hit cells carrying the calreticulin mutation. Potentially a game changer, but this, remember, is preclinical. It has not even made its way into early phase clinical trials. But I just wanted to highlight that because this, this was scored as extremely uh, highly as, a, as an exciting development. Uh, there's a drug called an LSD1 inhibitor, bomedemstat. And that's being trialed in patients with essential thrombocythemia who have not responded effectively to the standard treatment uh, hydroxycarbamide. And this really captures the data in, in one image. Here's the platelet count on the, um, on the, on the axis here. Here's the normal level of platelet count. And this is what happens to patients who went on to the study. It's a very powerful treatment for controlling the platelet count in patients with essential thrombocytemia. So this drug is being taken forward into a phase three trial. That's the type of trial that's randomized, so comparison of best available current therapies versus this new drug in a, in a randomized trial that will be open in the UK. Okay, polycythemia vera. I, I couldn't give this talk without talking about the magic study led by um, Claire Harrison. This, this was a, um, a study that, um, that tested the role of ruxolitinib versus best available therapy in patients with essential thrombocythemia, but I'm going to talk about, and polycythemia, but I'm just going to talk about the polycythemia vera arm of the trial because that's being re reported at the American Society meeting. And I think the results are very exciting. And I know some people in the room actually took part in this study. So this was a randomized study between ruxolitinib versus best available therapy uh, and one-to-one -one randomization. And the primary endpoint was uh, to study whether patients achieved what's called a complete hematological response or so normalization uh, of the blood counts. And the bottom line is, and this was kind of already known from other studies, is that ruxolitinib was more effective than best available therapy at achieving a complete remission in patients with polycythemia vera. But what we could do, because this was an academic-led study in the UK, is get much better data and follow up patients over five years to see you know, how powerful is this treatment? It's better at controlling the blood counts, but does that really matter for patients? Number one, the, uh, the blue here is the ruxolitinib uh, treatment, much more effective at, at sustaining a response in patients. Uh, and so many more patients in the, in the best available therapy arm needing uh, to switch treatment compared to ruxolitinib. But what's, I think, really exciting is that we also, we're finding that the ruxolitinib treatment reduces the incidence of complications of the disease, of so blood clots and progression of the disease. And, and that's, that's a big finding, I think. So this is an exciting treatment in polycythemia. At the moment, we don't have access to ruxolitinib for patients with polycythemia vera in the UK, but it's these data are going to be used to go to the National Institute of Clinical Excellence to try and justify getting this treatment funded for patients with polycythemia vera. So that's how taking part in clinical trials makes a massive difference for access to treatments for people in the UK. And now uh, 
Claire, again, is taking this forward in, uh, uh, not as a second line treatment, but actually as a first line treatment for patients with polycythemia. They're asking the question, well, if it's so effective for people who failed, or not people who failed, for people where first line standard treatment has failed them, um, what about using ruxolitinib treatment as a first line? And so this, this um, uh, trial is open in the UK. Again, randomized asking the question, JAK2 inhibitor versus best available uh, uh, therapy as a first line treatment. Okay, I'm, I'm conscious I'm gonna have to speed up. So sorry, these last few slides are gonna go quite quickly. So uh, this is an interesting new treatment, not a very catchy name because it's, it's not got uh, a very advanced in clinical development, um, but this is a, a hepcidin uh, analog. So and hepcidin is a really important uh, um, control mechanism for iron in the body. And you'll probably be familiar that iron is absolutely essential for red blood cell production. So if you can interfere with the hepcidin cycle, you can interfere with red blood cell production. So what they tested in this study is whether using this hepcidin analog can actually ca um, calm down excessive red blood cell production in patients with polycythemia vera. And um, in brief, the answer is this looks pretty interesting uh, uh, as, as a treatment to help prevent the need um, for venesections for phlebotomies in patients with polycythemia vera. Exciting new treatment, more to come. Interferon, I just put up a slide to say uh, there's new forms of interferon coming. Vesremi is an exciting new form of interferon uh, and uh, the, the, the studies are on, ongoing and um, they're presented at the ASH meeting. Okay, very briefly at the end, you can see why this was a challenge. Don't read this slide, whatever you do. Uh, <laughs> I just put this up to say how incredibly exciting a time this is in the field of myelofibrosis and myeloproliferative neoplasms generally, there is huge activity and in clinical development, many, many different agents in clinical development. I'm just going to briefly touch on um, the new JAK2 inhibitors that are coming through and two drugs that are being used in combination with the standard JAK2 inhibitor therapy. Uh, and I'm going to be pretty quick. Okay, so um, new JAK2 inhibitors. Uh, I guess the big news uh, in the UK is that fedratinib is now available for patients with myelofibrosis who have not responded as well as we would like to the standard JAK2 inhibitor treatment. So that is available as a second line treatment. But there are new JAK2 inhibitors coming. Pacritinib is, is particularly, I think, going to be useful for patients with myelofibrosis who have a low platelet count, thrombocytopenia, low platelet count. Momolotinib is a new JAK2 inhibitor coming. Um, and with some very exciting clinical trial data that will soon be published showing that it's an effective treatment for patients with myelofibrosis who have uh, disease-associated anemia. And that's important because um, ruxolitinib treatment, the one that's currently available, can actually make anemia worse. Okay. I said I was going to catch up time a bit, but I'm not doing a great job there. Um, okay, last, last two things I'm going to talk about are... Um, these class of proteins called BET proteins. And, and BET proteins are, are uh, proteins that control gene expression. And they're really, really important in myeloproliferative neoplasms because uh, abnormal activity of these BET proteins leads to inflammation, contributes to splenomegaly, contributes to uh, uh, the development of anemia and constitutional symptoms, all the cardinal features of myelofibrosis. And, and there's... BET inhibitor treatments that have been developed to see if that will reverse this process. And the one that's in, in lead clinical development is um, CPI 0610, um, which was tested in the manifest study and has now actually got a proper name, which is Pilabrasib. And um, this was used initially in combination with ruxolitinib uh, as a first line treatment in, in arm three of this study. And th these waterfall plots you may be familiar with um, uh, uh, basically show how effective this treatment is at shrinking the spleen. So anything going downwards on this waterfall plot means the spleen is shrinking. Here's the magic 35% spleen volume reduction, which means the spleen has shrunk by more than half in simple terms. Very, very effective combination treatment for shrinking the spleen in myelofibrosis and improving symptoms. This is the total symptom score. 
So that looks a very interesting new treatment, and this is being taken forward in a large phase three study as a first-line treatment uh, for patients with myeloid fibrosis comparing uh, ruxolitinib plus palabrasib with a placebo control in a randomization, and that is open in the UK at the moment. Just to mention, we also have a study running uh, in the UK called the PROMISE study uh, that, is being, that is testing a different BET inhibitor treatment, uh, and that's open at many sites across the UK for patients who are on ruxolitinib who are not responding as well as we would like, uh, as in they still have an enlarged spleen, and it's testing whether the addition of this BET inhibitor treatment um, might um, uh, improve symptoms and, and help shrink the spleen. The other interesting drug that's coming through um, uh, is Novitaclax. This again is being used in combination with ruxolitinib treatment. It's been tested uh, in a phase two trial. Again, very interesting data showing um, in patients who have not responded as well as we would like to ruxolitinib, if you add it in, it shrinks, helps shrink the spleen and improve symptoms. And again, this is being taken forward in a large phase three uh, randomized study as a first-line treatment for patients with myeloid fibrosis. So asking the question uh, of whether if you use a combination treatment up front for myeloid fibrosis, is that better than just using ruxolitinib uh, on its own? So incredibly exciting times in the field of myeloid neoplasm research. Hopefully I've got that across. And thank you very much for listening. Here's a picture of Oxford. Thank you, Adam. What really exciting times we are living in now. It's absolutely brilliant.